بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد خاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحابة يجمعين اللهم افتح علينا فتو العارفين والحقنا بالصالحين وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول ويتبع حسنا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and I hope you've had a um, couple of productive sessions with Sheikh Amir um, I'm going to be continuing on where he left off and um, probably um, navigating through the title of, of the weekend's retreat. So obviously this is a retreat. It's not, as my wife said, a treat for those that have kids. Um, so the retreat is there obviously to, to think. I, I think Sheikh Amr talked about um, the spiritual um, side of the challenges that people face. A lot of what we do face is internal. Uh, and a lot of um, the problems that we end up falling in front of are also um, our un inability to deal with external things that come in our way, which are always, according to you know, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, all these things are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single thing that you experience, and I was, I was just texting somebody who suffered a heart attack recently, uh, and I, I texted him that, you know, it's a blessing for those that look for it. Because it, it really, everything that is from God, every letter that you receive in your life, every experience that you come um, into, um, you know, into contact with, from one perspective is somebody else, from one, another perspective is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using that thing or that person to engage with you, whether it's good or evil. This is why, you know, in Arabic they say, Kam min ni'matin fi thawbi ni'ma. How many, um, a blessing is, is cloaked and hidden in, in, in what seems to be a calamity. That is a faith-based understanding of our situation. And the unfortunate thing nowadays is that that faith-based understanding of tribulations, of the trials that we have and the challenges that we have and how we face them and how we, we deal with them authentically according to our own faith tradition, I think that's been jettisoned and that's been sidelined very slowly and very um, flyly by, by certain um, you know, kind of actors within society. To the point that we don't even notice that we're moving from being a religious community to being a, to being a community which is very much based upon its identity as a political group, as all you know small identity you know you know political groupings are identified as being small groups you know making up this kind of matrix. So what I wanted to do was to look at what I think what I you know I was thinking over the last three four days about um, the topic. Myself and Sheikh Amr came up with this title. Um, you know about the storm and how to face up to the storm and what I mean the whole thing is what is the storm it's not really um, explained it's not really um, covered in much detail because everybody I think this morning you had a session where you were kind of looking at those aspects you're looking into what you think that is and everybody has their own perspective so this is only my perspective I don't think um, I hold you to agree with anything that's in this um, session but it's my own reflections over the last 10 years of how um, things are going um, at the, at the very core of that, I think, is identity and understanding identity, what it is and what it means and what makes up our identity uh, and also the change of that specific thing. And I think that is an ex existential threat for, for the ummah. The ummah meaning our, the, the, the global Muslim community. And even that word ummah we can't use now. I don't know if you know this, but it's politically uh, incorrect. I, I'm sure you could get in prison for saying ummah in a specific context because it will be seen as being calling to some kind of political caliphate state that covers every single you know, country on the globe. So you're kind of pigeonholed just by the use of a word, which is very much at the very core of our religious text of Quran and Kareem. So why is identity important? That's what I want to actually start to look at, because if I ask you, what's your identity? Obviously, you know, people from England never say they're English. I know that. I know, I'm in England now, and I know English don't. But the interesting thing is Scots do. Scots always, Muslim Scots always place Scottish Muslims very much being up there at the higher echelons of what they identify themselves as being. In other words, being Scottish and, and, and Muslim is never seen as being something that has some kind of disconnect. Whereas what I feel from my interactions with people down south, down south or here, <laughs> is that they're very much, they've been through the mill in terms of their identity. Um, and I was, I was, I've been told about this documentary in Huddersfield about um, the community there and its lack of identity and also the way it's fragmenting and all the kind of social ills apparently are supposed to be there. So it's interesting to look at the, how we define ourselves. In the Quran there's numerous, and I was thinking about there's numerous ways that the Quran describes identity. There's one of, one of which is just to use the word Muslim. 
and and you know you always have this thing of you know when you speak to people and 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 you pray in a certain way and then you say why and they say why are you praying like this and I said because I'm a Maliki and he said but I'm a Muslim <laughs> you also have to move your head a bit there's a, there's a specific and you you raise your finger as well a testification to faith as well um, and it comes from this uh, this this verse of the Quran وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلٍ مِمَّا دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةَ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better um, the, in their in their speech than the person that calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so their speech calls to Allah but it's interesting this verse this is a, a byproduct of this وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَةَ and acts well actually means when you're calling you have to act well it's a condition it's وَوَ الْمَعِيَّةَ it's not like عطف which a lot of people translate as being the best of people in terms of their, their speech and what they call to is a person that calls to God as well as that they also do good actions no, it's a condition to call, to call to God that you do good actions you have to have the characteristics of that and also they say وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ I'm of, of those that submit so we take away right away I'm a Muslim there's nothing wrong with that identifier in fact um, it is the primary identifier through which we, we, we set ourselves apart from other people but also in the Quran, it talks about the Ummah has having a, a very much some kind of role, some kind of ultimate um, place in, in communities. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrizat lin nas, that you're the best of Ummahs. Ummah is that very important word. Ukhrizat uh, lin nas, who, who have been extracted, brought out of humanity for the service of mankind. It's almost as if you're here to serve. So one of the aspects of your identity is that if you're not serving and if you're not um, acting in a way that is trying to better other people and not just better your own Muslim kind of identity group you're not within this uh, ummah then you're not from the best of ummahs so that kind of aspect comes out as well but you also have this aspect which is about worship which is the ultimate purpose which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that we have not created the jinn and the, and, and the humans except uh, to worship worship me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the ultimate reason why you're placed on earth, your soul is placed in your body and then your nafs is told to submit to the commands of God and that's how you start to become a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you get to this idea that ultimately our, our, our identifier should be the degree to which we worship God in the way that He subhanahu wa ta'ala would want us to worship Him which is to worship Him and it's interesting Allah says وَعِبَادُ Rahman. The servants, the worshippers of God, no sorry that's not the right translation, Ar-Rahman, the worshippers of the Rahman, the merciful, the compassionate, are those that walk meekly on the earth and when they are, they are spoken to by people of ignorance, they say salam. The interesting thing about this is, they're not worshipping and they're coarse and they're harsh, they're the, they're, they're the slaves of Ar-Rahman meaning that they're inculcated with this compassion and mercy for people in, even in the process of being Muslim, even in the process of being people that worship God. So we have to think, our identifiers are, are labels, our identifiers are, are moral characteristics, our identifiers are our ethical um, outlook. And that's very similar to the, you know, the verse of the Quran, Ar-Rahman ala al-Ash istawa, where Allah says that it is the merciful that has sat upon the throne, established himself upon the throne. Reason for that being, that it's not Allah, it's not Al-Adil, it's not Al-Qahar, it's not all these majestic names that God is going to be on the Day of Judgment when He judges us, it's the merciful. And so we always have to think, you know, identity is moving and we have to think, our identity, is it a religious identity? If it is, it has to submit to um, the conditions that God places upon the people that He says are His servants. They're not marked by harshness, they're not mar marked by hate speech, they're not marked by feeling the worst for other people, they're there wanting the best for other people. And the other thing I kind of notice about identity is it's non-spatial. What does that mean? It just means that we never identify with, identify with a specific geographical location. Ever since Islam spread, it never had this infatuation with people all you know, buying five-star you know, accommodation in Mecca al -Mukarram. In fact, the complete opposite, Imam Malik used to, once people arrived in Medit al he wouldn't let them loiter too much just in case they lowered their etiquette with the Prophet because that was very important your identity is partly based upon your love of the Prophet Ali your etiquettes and you have the famous narration of Salman al-Farisi he was very close to Abu Darda after the death of the Prophet the Prophet had made them um, he connected them in, in, in brotherhood um, when, they were, when they arrived in um, Medina al-Nawara 
And after the Prophet passed away, um, Abu Darda at a certain point went to Palestine and he went to Quds. And he wrote a letter to Salman al-Farisi who was in, he was in um, Iraq. And in the letter he said, come to the, to the Holy Land, the worship is multiplied, you're closer to God, the city of God as they say. And Salman al-Farisi, he said, Inna al -ard la ahada. He says, don't you know that the part of what he understood from the Prophet is that where you stay doesn't make anybody blessed in the eyes of God. The only thing that makes you blessed in the eyes of God is your actions. So spatially, our identity has never been about a specific piece of land. We're not fixated about any piece of land. So we should never make our identity that we called for the liberation of a specific piece of land being that is our identity. We do it in terms of it being just. And we go to the ultimate in terms of seeking redress for that. And it's non-racial. This is a revolutionary thing about our identity is that the Prophet ﷺ taught a teaching which predates by centuries any kind of similar call to completely obliterating racial inequality and even identifying race as being something that you allow somebody to be prejudicial against somebody else. And you have the, the Prophet most, the Prophet's most famous, most important um, opportunity to spread that was Hajjat al Wila when he had the majority, he had the most people he's ever spoken to. It's like prime time. And so what you're going to say in prime time is going to, going to have to be important. What did the Prophet talk about? He talked about um, in, in, in saving the environment. He talked about uh, equality of all peoples. He talked about the end of racism. He talked about the end of usury. All these things. He must have felt that they were right at the top of his agenda. So therefore, his identity was, was one that negated the fact that if you're Roman or you're, you're, you're Habashi or you're from the Persians, that you're inferior you could be superior. In fact, Salman al farisi the Prophet said, Salman minna ahl al -bayt. He said, Salman is from us. The Ahl al -bayt, he just made him part of his family, even though he's Persian. Um, so Islam has always been non-spatial, it's been non-racial, but it's also allowed multiple identities. And th this is going to be important because the attack on Muslim identity is in insisting that we, we have to choose identities. Islam, since it spread, if you know the history of Islam, it always allowed people multiple identities, linguistic, cultural, ethnic, all types. As long as there was nothing that, that combated basic teachings of Islam, you were allowed to keep your clothes. Alhamdulillah, we were allowed to keep our food. So you know, the Muslims that become Muslim in Shala in this country, they can have our spices. Because the worst, I mean, the thing that depresses me more than anything else is traveling and not finding anything decent to eat. Because that really is depressing because how can they survive? How can these people survive without any kind of, you know, kind of seasoning in their food? And, and, the, and the other thing is, moral identity is above all our other identities. The, the interesting thing about our, our faith is, whenever there was an attempt to break this religious, spiritual identity, it failed. And the famous example I'll, I'll give of that is, uh, you know, when Sayyidina Ma'awiyah and uh, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu karamallahu wajah, when they were, when they were in this civil war, uh, Heraclius, the, Byz the Byzantine Emperor, he sent a letter to Ma'awiyah, who, who was in Sham, and he says, I've heard about what's happening with your, um, with your co-religionist, Ali. He said, G give me permission to send um, an army and I'll bring you his head. In other words, he said, I'll, I'll help you. I'll, I'll, I'll send you an army and I'll defeat your enemy and what will happen is that you'll be victorious. And, and Sayyidina Ma'awiyah said, Akhan Tashajara, two brothers who have fallen out. So, in other words, we are two brothers that have fallen out. He said, I will send you an army, the beginning of which is at your court and the end of which is at my feet. And I'll take your head and I'll give it to Ali. <laughs> so, the interesting thing was, you know, the moment that identity it cut and it challenged religious identity, spiritual identity, it was a non starter. And that's what's interesting about. Nowadays we have, you know, when I was looking at this kind of topic, I was thinking that there's um, challenges, and I've, I've called them concentric. Don't, don't be put off by the, the big words. The challenge is a concentric wave that continues. So it's a concentric wave. What does that mean? It means that um, one thing affects the other. So these are not mutually exclusive. What I think is happening here is that we are, our identity, which is what I've just described, which I think has sustained itself over all the way up until the Second World War, 
and beyond that, until very recently, it has, it has existed within a meta-narrative and a theory where identities are based upon principles and they're fixed very much. The main identifiers, ethical identifiers are fixed. What's happened recently is that you have new theories about the fact that nothing is fixed. And the most important manifestation of that is, is postmodernism, that there's no truth. Like we're living in a society, I don't know if you're noticing it, but we're living in a society when the, where there is no truth and you cannot make a claim to truth in the public sphere. And you also have materialism, which is not as important. I think postmodernism is much more important. That is entrenched within society now. And what's happening is that that is going to filter into you. This is this wave that's coming and hitting you. Because it's hitting you and you have these, this identity that says, no, there's certain things, al jannatu haqq. The moment you say that the fire is real, I'm sorry, you cannot say that in the public sphere. Why? Because there's no truth. This is why when you read books of Aqidah, they just say, paradise is true, hellfire is true, the, the mizan is true. All these things are true because we have a revelation that said they're true and that's it. But we're coming into a situation where the, at the micro level, our level, we're being told that our faith is irrational because it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, we're, we're told it's violent, we're told it's um, exclusivist, and, and all these things are impacting upon us deep down. Because remember, spiritual diseases are not just, you know, things like anger and ostentation and envy, they're also uh, shubuhat. Shubuhat are, 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 are doubts that you have. And the doubts are precipitated from external forces. So if, if you have the kind of news anchor or some kind of political commentator or some kind of... Um, you know, YouTuber kind of making a, a, a you know, kind of sarcastic comment about Islam and you just think, oh, you kind of let it go. What you're doing is deep down you're allowing some sort of doubt, which is based upon your lack of respect of your own religious tradition, to allow that knowing away of your identity, which is an ethical identity. So we have to be very, very careful. And it leads to an ident ident a crisis of identity and a crisis of faith. And this is why, you know, the... The, um, the statistics on this are, are quite stark. If you go to the statistics that are you know, available in terms of America, you can see where everyone else is going. Because one of the things about religious history is that if you understand where America went in terms of religious minority, you understand where every other minority goes. If you look at Judaism, Judaism in terms of reformed, liberal, uh, orthodox and conservative, all that happened in America. And I guess, I guess, I don't know if you watch stuff, but this is what's happening in America as well in terms of Islam. And, and we celebrate the brown face or the hijabi face or the kufi face or the, the bearded face. Whereas we don't look at the identity from the perspective of our, of our ethical teachings. That's at the end of the day, if somebody's ethical and they don't share your religious um, teachings, but they're ethical, that person should be closer to you than a person that says they're ethical, but they undermine the religious tradition from which they, they come from constantly undermine it and, and underplay it. And what happens after that is the concentric circle reaches the point, it reaches the macro, which is the community, the ummah. The way that the community then organizes to face up to these challenges, these waves, is dictated by the individuals who make up that com community. So if the people have doubts in terms of their identity, or in terms of faith, and they have to face up to, say, Islamophobia, you know, co coining that term Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hate, then the response to that is not based upon them being ethically Muslim, it's based upon their identity as being um, from a Muslim background. And so they're basically you know, expedient in what they're doing. The only way to get out of this is to have your own meta-narrative and to insist upon it. Meta-narrative is what, what we had before. And from my perspective, Sheikh Amr's perspective probably as well, everybody, it would be this traditionalist uh, teaching that we've received you know, hand on hand from one teacher to another teacher. Ethical principles that do not change, but legal principles that do change, legal rulings that do change, they obviously change, but not the ethics, ethics of what we are. Um, and I think that's what we have to come back to. And I jotted, jotted down a couple of markers for this, this struggle that I see happening, identity struggle. One is the fact that ide our identity is not, dis not defined by our ourselves anymore. What you'll find is our, ident our identity is defined by somebody telling us, what are you? And it's interesting that the West itself, it's well known that they don't really, they've lost their identity. And one of the main uh, kind of theories out there is that the only way they can defend, define themselves is by defining the other, the enemy. 
uh, and uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to get into a secret here on who that is, but <laughs> and, and the other thing is capitulating to postmodernism. Our crisis essentially is just giving into this wave of postmodernism of saying there's nothing that is essentially true. Everything's relative. Religious truth is relative. Gender's relative. Political truth. Everything. Every ethical truth. Everything is relative. You're right and I'm right, everybody's right. I mean, it becomes, it gets down to that. And it leads on to what, are, what is called a cultural camp, which is like this cultural war that comes out of this. Because Muslims who are traditional will say, no, I believe this is true and this is God's law. And all of a sudden the West has to provide this kind of um, impasse against, the, against Islam to kind of challenge it, which is a very important development. And also we have this idea of being a minority as well. We, we're told we're a minority and we accept that as well. And probably the most pernicious and the most dangerous is, it seems to be a fantastic idea of individualism. Individualism meaning I have my own Islam. From my, from, from my training as religious studies, from my perspective, I'll see a person saying, well, this is what I understand the Quran to say, or this is what the Sunnah says, or this is how I practice my faith. And part of that is only God can judge me movement, hashtag. You know, that kind of, I mean, the, it's not supposed to be a joke. The point is that that has a theological basis, which is only Allah can judge. Absolutely true. But, that, you know, it's like they say, Kalimatul Haq, Urida Bihil Batil. A good word by which you mean something very evil. And this is why I always kind of, I never pull anybody up. If somebody says, you know, only God can judge me, I take the good meaning and I say, okay, that's true. Absolutely true. And only judge, God can judge him, okay? And I tell everybody that. But the point is, as a kind of movement, that's absolutely wrong. Because it means that you're making up, you're, you're saying that certain things that we know are wrong, they're right in this context. And so, theologically, you have people deciding what's right, but also in, in the natural world as well, which is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And, and I don't know if you kind of clicked on what I'm going to talk about. But basically, you can self-identify in terms of nature as well. So this is going, postmodernism is, is about deconstructing who you are and then putting you back together based upon what you feel. And then you assume that difficult choices require that you alter your identity. And this is quite important. The moment that you have a difficulty, you just say, okay, we just capitulate and just give up and just join the postmodernist bandwagon and just keep society going as it is. And the end result of this will be and is, and I've seen it over the last three years with various examples, is that the people that represent traditional values are vilified by the, the Muslims who say that they're now pro-individualism, uh, uh, pro-postmodernism, and they basically out them and shame them. And I've seen the, the, the representatives of, of... This is like, we're talking about centuries of scholarships, centuries of thought, centuries of civilization, just leaving the arena because it just can't be bothered with the muck that is in the arena itself. So it's very, very important because what, what that means is people that, are, that have know that something's wrong, will have nobody to speak to and to seek advice from when they realize something's wrong. And, and you know, tomorrow I'm going to be looking at just one example of that. So one of the things that's interesting here is that the West defines itself via Islam. Islam um, has never had a problem with its identity. But the West always has. And this is what Olivia Roy, he says that Islam is, is the mirror in which the West projects its own identity. It's very important you understand that. The West has jettisoned its, its religious roots. Judeo-Christian, mores and values. It doesn't know what it stands for. And in fact, even today, I was thinking it was today or yesterday, um, Putin, who's the, who's the president of, the, of, of, um, of Russia, he said that liberalism is dead. Like everything that they thought was at the base of their society and civilization has, has capitulated and failed. And if you look at all the leaders, if you look at Trump, I mean, is he, uh, you know, is he a liberal? If you look at the next um, prime minister of this, of your country, because um, we're leaving. <laughs> um, he's a great grandson of a, of a Turkish traitor. So he's leaving as well, but he, he's definitely not a liberal. I mean, he's, he's open, whatever he is. Um, and what we see is that we are now being told to, 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 to try and create our identity based upon the West telling us, okay, who are you so we can define ourselves? So tell us about yourselves, what's important for you? Because based on that, we will start to define ourselves. The problem there is that we already have identity. We shouldn't have to answer questions about identity at all. It's very important that you understand. Your identity is, is, is very much, in terms of ethics, is very much fixed. In terms of nationality, it's what passport you hold. There's no conflict in that at all. 
Um, and what the West is moving into, as I said before, postmodernism is very much this age of what you feel and what the individual in front of you is feeling. It's not the age of reason, it's not the age of enlightenment, it's not the age of science. It's the age of what you feel and I cannot um, affront what you feel. I cannot upset you in what you feel. If you say you're such and such a thing or such and such a person, I can't challenge you on that and say, look, you're not, you're actually something else. Oh, that hurt me, I hate speech. You know, then all of a sudden, because you've hurt my feelings, you can get thrown at you. There's examples of this in universities as well, where people get thrown at universities because they just state the obvious. But because the other side says, well, you've hurt my feelings, hate speech, you know, the political structures are, are becoming quite strange. And this is what's interesting about Islam is that we're now being told, because we're not playing game, we are being told we're regressive, we are backward, we are you know, living in a completely alien age and you have to come up with, you know, you have to come up to date. And this is why Islam represents the threat because Muslims are not just capitulating, you know, it's lying down. Every other religious civilization is, Islam's not. You don't see, I mean, I've not seen any other religious tradition um, challenge this at all. And therefore, the thing that happens is that you have this culture camp, which is a cultural war against Islam. You can't have a physical genocide yet. I'm going to add that word in because if you know history, you know, it was much better in the Weimar Republic before Hitler. Um, they, listen, they listen to Wagner and Beethoven and reading Goethe and all this kind of stuff that was so elevated. And, and so you can't imagine that people are illiterate now are going to do anything any better than, than the Nazis did. So the cultural war, war, you know, very much is headed by pro-enlightenment, secular voices like Richard Dawkins. If you just read his tweets, if you read his articles on Islam, full of hate. Because he realizes Muslims are not lying down and what he calls towards they're not just accepting. And so you have this hate speech, you know, in a, in a, in a good way, in what, one, one way you can define coming out of these, these, um, these quarters. The Christian right as well holds Islam, but less so antithetical to what Islam, to what, to what the West is. And it assumes two things. One is that Islam has a propensity towards cl a clash, a civilizational clash, which is what Samuel Hunt Huntingdon does. He says Islam has to and will lead to a clash between the Islam and the West. And the other thing is it's anti-democratic, which is what Bernard Lewis talks about all the time. Even though he doesn't realize that democracy in terms of history, in terms of the West, is a very, very recent, very recent phenomena. And he talks about Islam being anti-democratic from the time of Baghdad, the fall of Baghdad. So, I mean, as if he doesn't know his own European history. So it's very interesting, the cultural war is not, a, is not one which is based on any kind of logic, it is based upon hate. And this is Sam Harris. He says, is it possible to be a good Muslim and then po not pose a threat to civil society? He says the answer is no. In other words, it's not Islamic fundamentalism, it's not Islamism, it's not Islamic terrorism, it's Islam itself. There's no such thing he says famously as a good Muslim. And everybody who's with Sam Harris, everybody who shares a platform will say basically the same thing. And so this cultural war, I don't know if you know in, in the Christchurch episode that happened, Vienna came up. I don't know if you know that. This, you know, the person that committed these atrocities, you know, and even Bregvich, the, the person who massacred people in, in, in Norway, his manifesto was 20, 2083. 400 years from the Battle of Vienna. So what happens is they create myths to justify this clash. So in 1683, there was the, the famous Battle of Vienna, and um, uh, Sultan Mehmed the Fourth. Interesting enough, he he took an army which was, was he was allied with uh, the Catholic King of France. He was allied with the Hungarian opposition. He was actually allied by the Christian Cossacks as well. It wasn't a Muslim army. And on the other side, you had um, you had um, you had you had the Catholics, but you also had Protestants. You had the Poles, but we also had. Um, I'm sure you had Muslims in the, in the oppos opposing army as well. And so it wasn't, if you look back at history, it, it, historians who know their history never said that the Battle of Vienna was a battle between Islam, the Ottoman Empire trying to invade um, Europe and the Christian West. There's probably more Christians in, in the Ottoman army than there were in, in the, in the in, not, not, there wasn't more, but there was plenty. But that has been taken as, as a watershed representing 
the threat of the other. Remember, the West doesn't have an identity. It projects it based upon the other. The other is the Ottomans, the Turks, the, the Saracens. And if you go to lots of them, um, if you go around Britain, you'll see the pubs, the Saracens' head. Can you see that? That is like, I don't know if you know what that means. I hope you, hope you don't think, next thing you go past it. I mean, just think about that. Um, so this is a narrative which is, which, is, which is made up to show that there's some kind of history to this kind of conflict. And the interesting thing is this, this cultural war against Islam, the propaganda Islam, some Muslims will never be able to survive. If you look at the Arab world post-Arab Spring, you know, I was reading a couple of articles about non-religious identity in the Arab world. In Egypt, since the, the Arab Spring has started, um, that has inc increased threefold. It's doubled in Tunisia. And that's a kind of ongoing story. And that's nothing compared to the West. I don't, and it's not, it's not something that people think about, but it's something that's there. The constant pressure of postmodernism upon Muslim minds the, at the micro level is gnawing away our, our identity, which means very quickly, unless we start to provide an, uh, an alternative meta narrative, there'll be no. I wouldn't say no Muslims, there will be nobody with that cultural, deep ethical identity left. And we also, we are we're identified, or we're told to identify as minorities. And you know that minorities are always um, defined in contradistinction to the majority. You know, a minority assumes majority. Majority assumes power. Majority assumes we, we lay down the rules of this game. And this is why the majority defines what's civilized. And there's numerous um, writings about, you know, the West defined what was civilized in the 18th century. It was to be fully clothed. So they used to, they used to go uh, and, and colonize a country and they would see these barbarians are naked, semi-naked barbarians. That's the kind of constant. You flip it, 21st century, you know, it's the opposite, which is the majority defines what is moral, what is ethical, what is correct, what is civilizational. And we can't just capitulate and say we're a minority. What's your minority status? We're a Muslim. We have to start to think about what does that mean in terms of our identity. We have to start to focus on that a bit more. And the other thing about this is that our minorities, even our own community, is shifting minorities in terms of, you know, initially in the 60s when people came here, they were, you know, Indo-Pakistani. And then, I don't know, in the good old days in the 80s, even the Pakistanis wanted to be Asian, so Indians, and they were all kind of very close to yeah, the Bhangra movement. All this kind of stuff, the kind of Asian, you know, there was a kind of a period in the 80s when that happened. But then, the more that this postmodernism comes into being, the more that you get this identifier as Islam as being your, your essential identifier. So Muslims become more practicing, initially in a religious sense, but then later on, a post-religious sense in terms of identity. And this is the period we're in now. So Muslims will be politically active, will be interested politically in what they're doing, but the religious aspects, the practice of it, the spirituality, the adhkar, the study of sacred learning, the, the even giving any importance to what is halal, what's haram, that's becoming secondary to you know, this kind of idea of it's the consequences, it's, it's utility that's important, not the actual principles themselves. And Muslims end up coalescing around this idea of Muslims as minority. And what it does is, it doesn't give Islam as an identity anything, but it gives the West further clarity of what it is because it defines their enemy. And that's very, very important that you understand that the issue of identity is not for us to be able to project our voices. It's for the West to understand where it is and what it is. If you look at the European elections, that's one thing that comes out for me is all the parties that do well are the ones that are placing right the, big, the, the front of their manifesto. We are European and guess why? Not because we do all the things that Europeans used to do and whatever that means, but it's because we want the Turks out, we want the French out, we want the, the, the subcontinent Muslims out. That's what we want. We want to make Britain great again. And I guarantee that, that, that slogan, that mantra is the same mantra all over Europe. Great again, meaning there's some kind of cancerous growth in our societies, which we need to get rid of, which is destroying our identity. What's your identity? We don't know. We know it is something because they're not part of our identity. And why is that? Because they hold on to some kind of moral um, identity. And then the kind of next aspect of this is identity politics. Identity politics is a very interesting, not a lot of Muslims 
um, are aware of this or even think it's important, but it's extremely important. Identity politics is basically about creating subsections of society based upon what they feel they are. And so society was, in the past, it was made up of subjects to the king or the queen. Then it was, you know, it went in, in once um, nation states were created, it was about citizenship. You had citizens who were equal. And now what you have is because people have feelings and people have individual identities, there's this idea of each identity has its political or its ability to push its own agenda. And so you have lobby groups. That's perfectly fine. If people want to um, forward their own ethical or, or cultural or political identity, it's perfectly okay. The issue here is that there'll be a kind of um, hierarchy, which is happening in Europe. I mean, in, in Britain, I don't know if you know um, a specific thing in Birmingham. What you see playing out there is hierarchies. Everybody has a right to their identity. Everybody has a right to their beliefs. But guess what? If you're competing with somebody else, we're going to decide which one is more important. And usually, the one that coalesces greater to a greater degree with postmodernism and feeling and, and everything is, 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 is free to go, that's going to be given priority. And that's what's happening now is that identity politics is, is giving you know, different parts of society you know, kind of um, rights. But also it creates the situation where other identity groups are seen to be in competing, um, a competing context with others. So what that, what that leads to is um, people that are you know, kind of basically basing their religious teachings upon, um, or their ethical teachings based upon religious scripture are being sidelined at that moment in time. So the other thing, is, the other thing about identity politi politics is that you have to be part of the part of the agenda. You have to be part of this. You have to buy into identity politics, and that means you buy you're buying into identity politics means you have to buy into the postmodernist uh, agenda as well. Now, if you don't, you're sidelined. And the interesting thing now is in Islam, which is one of these, you know, what, the reason I was saying is an existential threat, is that it leads to the fragmentation of Muslims themselves. So you have people that say, look, we're gonna. We're going to join this bandwagon, bandwagon of postmodernism and, and the age of feeling, and everybody's got rights and everything. Everything's happy, Larry. And if you're not, then we don't want anything to do with you. And also, we're going to openly attack you. So traditionally, this is why I mentioned here I mean, previously and here again, traditionalist voices. That means everybody who sticks to what they believe to be true and right are being sidelined, vilified, and outed. And there was there was examples. Um, I'll talk about it tomorrow actually when it's more controversial. Um, tomorrow's session will be more controversial, so I'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, the last thing is individualism, which is again a, a fallout of, of the age of feeling. It's, it's a fallout from postmodernism, which is something that progressive Muslims are seeking and promoting and taking on as, as a badge of honour. It's a mantra. The individual, and this interest, I was at, in the House of Lords on Monday, and Lord Allardyce, who was hosting the event on finance, because we were discussing about ethical values and the fact that Christianity and Islam have certain shared values in in, 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 in economic sense. And he was saying that even that, you know, we have shared values, but we have to understand that not everybody agrees with what we identify as being shared. And not everybody agrees with what we identify as being important. And he was talking about China. He said, China, China's criticism of the West is that it's too individualistic. And his other, he said the other thing they say, because he's traveled a lot, he's, he was involved in the Northern Ireland peace process and things. So he, he's, he travels a lot dealing with conflict. So he was saying the other thing the Chinese say is that the West is on the wrong side of history in terms of the balance between the individual and society. Because he says every traditional society place more importance on the society on the, the, the tribe, on the family, than it did on just the individual. In other words, if the individual, their right clashed with the right of society and state and tribe and family, then it wasn't given precedence. And he says the interesting thing is the West feels as if the individual manifestation of a person's being is the most important. It's interesting for Muslims as well, what Muslims think, because my own reading of, of the Sharia is that that's exactly what Islam says as well. 
that, you know, the greater good. All these things are, are very much part and parcel of our religious tradition. But progressive Muslim thinkers are saying the exact opposite. And the interesting is that this individualism leads to self-identification. And this happens in terms of theology. In other words, I will decide what's halal, what's haram. I will decide what this hadith means. I will decide that I can put the whole corpus of hadith to a side. I can decide what this verse of the Quran means. And I can also decide what, what nature has made, has, has laid in store for me as well. And the interesting is that th those two things represents the perfect storm for me. Because you have Muslims who now define what Islam is based upon their individual reading. And so you can go anywhere with that. You can make anything halal if you decide that that specific verse of Quran was historically only relevant to those people and it's no longer historically valid to this time and this age because the Quran would have intended to abrogate. And you'll come up with all these arguments. And then you'll have humans that define what humans are. In other words, redefine. In other words, in, in fact, they won't even use human because that's hate speech. Human. Man? Man. <laughs> you can't use human. I mean, I don't know if you know this. This is microaggression. I don't know if you know that word. I told my wife about this. She didn't know about it. Microaggression. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll leave that to tomorrow. <laughs> but the interesting is, the reason why it's, why it's quite interesting is that logically you can have a Muslim who will ident attempt to ident identify theologically, redefine theologically what it means to be human. If that makes sense. Well, a Muslim who, who will, based on religious scripture, justify the changing of what nature says is. I don't know if you've clicked on what that means. So, that is not a man, is, is a man. No, it's not, because the scripture here I can identify and interpret it in a way that says the person is a he, she. Okay, I don't know if you know what that means, but I'll talk about that tomorrow. He, she is transitioning between things. And so what you have is self-identifying, self-defining, you re redefine religion, you redefine gender, you redefi redefine identity. And as I said before, only God can judge me. That whole thing is based upon a philosophical basis. It's all based upon this kind of fluidity that we have in terms of thought. And the fact that you don't have the carnal virtues, you don't have you know, the deadly sins anymore. It's all relative. And what's interesting to remember here is something that Muslims think will never be a problem. And I've kind of captured it in this quote by Asis Nandi. He says that, Every single culture is exclusive in some way. You know, Muslims always think that this culture is, is um, progressive, it's tolerant, uh, it's accepting. Every culture by definition is not. He says that all cultures exclude even those associated with humanism and progress, and even those dedicated to tolerance, dialogue and plurality. The point is that if you go against that, or if you don't sing to the tune that they have set in terms of what's tolerant, what is based, what is, what is, what's an understanding of dialogue, what is the ex existence of plural, plurality within society, if you don't go along with that, we'll be in, Ill -tol intolerant. And Sam Harris is a perfect example, progressive, free thinker, um, you know, ticks all the boxes, but he advocated the, 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 the nuclear bombing of Muslim countries uh, four years ago, because if he thinks that Muslim countries are not tolerant, not progressive, not pluralistic, not democratic, he says, well, we don't want this type of human on human on the, on the face of this earth. So that tolerance has a limit. And that's why it's important that you have a meta-narrative. The importance of meta-narrative as a response to this is actually very, very important. And so this session has brought it to the, us to the point where I've kind of left this idea of um, self-identification, individualism open to a case study. I'm going to do a case study tomorrow, which is on gender. So I'm going to look at how this all plays out in a very practical way in terms of a very specific question, which is to do with gender identity. Because that brings together everything. It brings together postmodernism, what the West views about itself and how it's changed. It brings together the traditionalist voices within the Muslim community. It brings together the progressives in the Muslim community. It brings together politics. It brings together the media, it brings together identity, it brings everything in this fantastic what, wave that you know, we are having to articulate and face. And so the way that you respond to that is 
you need to know what is happening, what's this process that's have taking place. It's not just the gender issue, it's not just about um, religious identity, it's about wider issues that we need to grapple with, inshallah. So inshallah, tomorrow morning, um, I'm looking forward to doing that, which will be a kind of a quick overview of, 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 of gender theory and then how it impacts on Muslims today, and which will be um, which will bring out all the kind of theoretical things we've done today, inshallah. So jazakallah khair for, for, for that. Um, I think I went over time slightly, but jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.